Welcome to the Let's Get Vulnerable podcast with me, your host, Dr. Morgan Anderson, clinical psychologist, relationship coach, love expert, creator of the ESL relationship method and athletic wear connoisseur. My mission is to help you raise your self-worth, have great relationships and step confidently into the next level of your life. Each week, two episodes will air featuring expert advice, live coaching, and tips showing you exactly how to improve your life and attract great relationships. You deserve to feel empowered, secure, and loved. So buckle up and let's get vulnerable. What's up? Let's get vulnerable listeners. I have amazing news for you. I am going to do a live masterclass happening May 27th, 6 p.m. PST. This is going to be a masterclass all about how to embody the securely attached woman. So actually becoming the securely attached woman, because it's one thing to know what you're supposed to do. It's another thing to actually transform and become that version of you. So you should join me because I'm going to go over how to let go of your past relationships once and for all, how to become securely attached in love. And I'm also, for the first time ever, I'm going to give you the secrets on how to harness the power of feminine energy so that you can do less while dating and you can attract the relationship you've always wanted. This is going to be super fun. I only do these every once in a while. And honestly, they fill up so quick and we have limited spots. So make sure you go sign up for that masterclass as soon as possible. And you can find the link to sign up in the show notes. It'll also be in my Instagram bio. It'll say masterclass sign up. So make sure you sign up. Don't miss out. I can't wait to see you there. It is live. I will be answering your questions. It's going to be a party. Bring your kombucha, bring your wine, whatever you want. May 27th, 6 p.m. PST. We are going to have a blast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very special episode of the Let's Get Vulnerable podcast. We have Terry Cole here with us today. I am so excited to have you. Welcome, Terry. Why, thanks. Me too, Morgan. I'm so excited. (laughs) So before we get going here, I want to give you an introduction, just tell you a little bit about Terry. So she is a New York-based licensed psychotherapist, relationship expert, founder of the Real Love Revolution, Boundary Bootcamp, and the co-founder of Crushing Codependency. Her female empowerment courses reach women in over 90 countries. Prior to her current incarnation as a love and boundaries expert, Terry was a bi-coastal talent agent negotiating endorsement contracts for supermodels and celebrities. Her eventual disenchantment with the world of entertainment led her to change careers in her 30s to become a psychotherapist and empowerment expert, which is awesome, Terry. I love that you did that. (laughs) She has since made it her mission to teach as many women as possible to establish and maintain effective boundaries with ease and create and sustain healthy, vibrant relationships. For the past two decades, Terry has worked with some of the world's most well-known personalities from international pop stars, athletes, Broadway performers, and TV personalities to thought leaders and Fortune 500 CEOs. She empowers over 250,000 people weekly through her published articles and blog posts, illuminating videos, therapeutic meditations, online courses, and her popular podcast, The Terry Cole Show. You are busy. I love it do it a lot. (laughs) Um, Terry's approach combines the best of practical psychology and Eastern mindfulness practices. She has a gift for making complex psychological concepts accessible and then actionable so that clients and students achieve sustainable change, i.e. true transformation. She's been featured as an expert therapist and master life coach on A&E's Monster In-Law's 
TEDx, The Lisa Oz Show, Real Housewives, and had a weekly radio show on Hay House Radio. She's also a regular contributor to Huffington Post, Possibly Positive, The Daily Love, Well and Good, and has been featured in L Forbes, Origin, Vogue, Self, and was honored to grace the cover of Inspired Coach Magazine. And her latest book, which we're going to talk all about, is called Boundary Boss, The Essential Guide to Talk True, Be Seen, and Finally Live Free. Terry is sharing a specific skill set to help you stop living out learned boundary behaviors that don't serve you. The techniques, tools, and strategies in this book will teach you to align your choices and boundary behaviors with your most authentic self and exercise personal agency. You can learn more about her work at terrycole.com. Woo. Wow. That was a mouthful. (laughs) You know, but I had to read it. It's funny because I, I, was, I was telling you, I don't typically read everything, but right. you have accomplished so much and it's clear you are doing so much good work in the world. I wanted our listeners to know what an amazing honor this is to have you on the show. Oh, thank you, Dr. Morgan. Yeah. That's so nice of you. It's true. <laughs> and you just re- released your book, April, April 20th. I did. I did. It was a long time coming. Yeah. Before we get into all that, I I really want to know what was it that led you to boundary work specifically? You know, they say like you teach what you most need to learn. So I definitely had, um, I was a boundary disaster for sure in my 20s and didn't realize that a lot of the painful experiences that I was having, my lack of satisfaction, feeling frustrated, feeling marginalized, feeling misunderstood, that all of those things, um, until I really was dove into my own therapy, I didn't realize that they were connected to having disordered boundaries. Once I did, then I was like, wow, so I can change this. Amazing. And then once I became a psychotherapist, I saw, holy crap, it wasn't just me. Mm -hmm. This is an epidemic with my highly competent female clients. Because that was really my clientele was like women who are Mm -hmm. crushing it in life, but doing it at the expense of themselves. And so that ended up being what it was about, where again, they they didn't know it was having boundary issues either. So I became obsessed once I was able to change it in my own life and knew that it was possible to. Yes. I just started in the trenches with my clients and that was almost 25 years ago. Wow. I love it. And I work with very driven, very successful women in relationships. So there's mm-hmm. a lot, there's a lot of overlap, I think, in oh, who yeah. we serve. And yep. obviously boundaries are such a huge part of healthy romantic relationships, all relationships, et cetera. So I know everything we talk about today is gonna really serve the the listeners. Um yeah. And For you, having that realization, seeing the change in your own life, and it was just this this piece of, hey, other people need this. This is this huge improvement in my life. Things are making sense. And I know that that other women specifically need this work. Yeah. You know what actually happened? It's like in my therapy practice, no matter who came through the door, right? They all have a presenting problem. Yeah. So the presenting problem could be, I'm not sure if I want to stay in my marriage or I can't figure out my physical wellness. Like, you know, I say I'm going to lose 25 pounds, but I never do. I don't know what the deal is. Right. Um, I'm unhappy at work. My family of origin is a nightmare. My mother is super controlling. I have a narcissistic parent. Mm-hmm. Any of those things, I was able to connect their pain to their lack of having this skill set. And that's when I really got like lit up about how can I create a way that this information becomes accessible to people. So if you look at the way that the the way the book is laid out, it is extremely um, 
practical. <laughs> it's yes. very much like step one. <laughs> yes. We're all we're dealing with you, the reader. It's not like a whole thing about my whole friggin' life. Yes, and I do share some stories, whatever. But yeah. and I do I share case studies in in every um, chapter because that's interesting. It's an easy way to learn. But the entire book is about the reader. So I teach something, and then I go. There's a section that's called back to you. So immediately I'm asking you, so if you were to do an inventory of the people in your life right now, do you think you have any boundary bullies? Make a list or whatever. So it's a very active book because what I found, once I saw this in my practice, about five years ago, I decided to see, can what I do in a room privately with one person, can, can that success that I've had in all these, you know, over two decades, can I move that into a virtual space and do it with a group of women? Is that possible? Will it work? Right. You, right. You, you, you like, don't know, right? You don't know yeah. until you do it. So I beta tested this a course called Boundary Bootcamp about five years ago. And then I took all the data so I did a massive survey of thousands of women of A, what are their biggest pain points around boundaries, explaining what it is. But then I changed the course based on the feedback that I got. And I didn't write the book until I was running that course for five years. Beautiful. You know, because I'm like, but does it really work? Does it actually stick? Let's see what happens. Let's let's keep following up. So really what's in the book is like the cream of the cream of what works and what is essential, you know? I love what you're saying. And it's, it so resonates with how I try to teach as well, which is break it down, make it accessible and really step-by-step, step, Hey, this is actionable. You can apply this immediately to your life and see yep. results. People, because people need that. They do. And here's the thing. None of us has time to be like, I'm going to go, you know, sit on a, mountain in India for four months. Like, I mean, it'd be great if we did, but we don't. <laughs> and so in your busy life, right? I found that the only way to reach my audience, which are these highly functional women who have yes. like massive careers and families and whatever, yes. was to be like, this is it. Next right action and not further. We're literally like, and the next is this. And the next is this. So you don't have to, because again, if you're also highly functional, mm -hmm. you're just making frigging decisions all day. Right. And you're like, dude, the last thing I want to do is that. So can you just tell me now what's next? Just tell yes, me I what can. To do. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So powerful. Tell me, tell me about your experience in writing this book. And <laughs> as, as myself, I'm working on a book and I've removed all timelines because I've just realized it's, it's being born. It's, I, I can't put an exact date on it. Um, right. So I have a little taste of what it's like, but what was it like for you to write this book? Tell me about it. You know, it's interesting the way that I did it, you know, so many of my friends, so many people thought I had a book because I've been out here doing this for a really long time. Yeah. So, and even the, my publisher, they had approached me, they'd been pursuing me for about two years mm -hmm. and they had approached me about doing a course. And I was mm -hmm. talking to my girlfriend, Danielle Laporte, and I was like, oh yeah, you know, sounds true. Got in touch. They want me to do an audio course on boundaries. I'm looking at the contract. I don't know. She was like, Tara, why would you do an audio book on boundaries when A, you have a full course on boundaries yourself yeah. Don't you want them? Don't you want to write a book? And I was like, well, I do. She's like, well, then go back and tell them, forget this contract. I want to write a book. So I, I did that. And they were like, dude, we thought you had a book. You don't have a publisher. <laughs> they were like, yes. Oh my gosh. Wow. Who, who so, so in one respect, it was it was, I sort of did it backwards. A lot of people are like younger folks are like, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to build my platform around that book. And I just built the shit out of my platform. Right. I've had a podcast that is in the top 20 of mental health consistently. I'm, I'm just coming up on my 2 millionth download. Like I've, I've had a podcast for six years where I'm talking about releasing an episode every friggin' week, if not more, mm -hmm. just consistently showing up, mm -hmm. doing the work, showing up, doing the work. So with the book, it wasn't, I don't know that, I don't know other people's experience, except a lot of my friends have books, you know, but yeah. this is something that I've been so, I was so passionate about for so long. And because I had the course, I really kind of knew like, yeah. this is 
the content, the transformational content, I have an idea of what are the things going to be, yeah. but then you got to figure out the rest of it. So writing, all right, there, there was a parallel process going on the writing of the book. How am I doing that? And then, Oh, I'm going to write a book and then COVID hits. Mm-hmm. I'm going to write a book and then COVID hits. And then my mother, I have three older sisters and my mom, who's now 83, who I'm extremely close to. She lives about an hour away from me mm-hmm. and have been always, she's just incredible. Mm-hmm. She gets diagnosed with anal cancer. Mm-hmm. It's such the worst. It's a terrible cancer to get. It's terrible treatment. And because it was the beginning of this epidemic, this um, pandemic yeah. that we didn't know. Do you remember? They were like, old people shouldn't go anywhere, basically. <laughs> and the hospital's like, she should start treatment. We were like, um, hi. Mm-hmm. But, and my mother decided, because there's nothing wrong with her mind. She's fine. So she was yeah. like, listen, if I get COVID, I'm probably going to die. I think I'm going to roll the dice. We're going to put off treatment for at least four weeks to see what the CDC says. Let's just see how contagious this thing is, how dangerous it is. It was so stressful. Can I just tell you? It was so stressful. Wow. Because now I'm, I'm under a super deadline. You were like, I'm going to be free with time. Yeah. I wrote this book in a very short period of time. Wow. Chris, my girlfriend, Chris Carr was like, Tara, do not agree to write this book in less than a year. There's no freaking way. I was like, oh no, I'm writing this book. I've already committed to writing this book in less than six months. And I ended up actually writing this book in about two months. I, wow. I, it was sick. Don't, I ne- would not recommend it to anyone. <laughs> Don't try that in the middle of my mom. But thank God I, I have, you know, my, my sisters are amazing and we came together wow. and my mom is cancer free. Thank God. Thank I'm going to knock on some thank wood. God. Okay. Yeah. I, I can't. That's because wow. none of this would. I mean, listen, you know, everyone is going to transition at some point. I was like, just not now though, mom, like just maybe another 10 years. Okay. Could you please? So anyway, that was all happening. So the amount of um, internal boundaries (laughs) that was required for me to stick to this schedule. And thank God I had um, an editor who was really like a collaborator, a collaborator on the book. Her name is Suzanne Gallette. So I just love her. So she comes up to my, I, I live on a little farm in upstate New York. We call it Crackpot Farm. Literally, I live in the middle of nowhere. I and I've had too. an apartment. You do? I live in Montana on a ranch, middle of nowhere. Oh my God, I love it. Look at us. It's <laughs> just the best. It really is. But, it, but for years, I also had had an apartment in the city, in the East Village. Yeah. I had a rent stabilized place that I was like, hi, I never give that up until I have to. Right. And then about a year and a half ago, I had to, so I did. Um but she came up to my house. We were going to do a brainstorming weekend and then COVID really exploded. Mm -hmm. And I was like, dude, do you want to just move in? She was like, okay. She literally moved into my house with me and my husband (laughs) and stayed here for, I think, 15 weeks. It was amazing. I have no words. That's incredible. I was like, this is perfect because she also lived in Queens, which was literally the epicenter of the coronavirus yeah. in the beginning, the most dangerous place you could be. I was like, don't even go get your stuff, Suze. Just yeah. stay. I got tons of clothes. We can shop. Wow. Just just stay. And wow. she did. <laughs> That's incredible. That's incredible. I love this idea of the parallel process of as you're writing about boundaries, you're having to navigate so many new boundaries and how to handle them. Not to mention even the process of writing a book is a very boundary process. Can, can you talk about, cause I think people miss this piece boundaries with yourself sure. and what that means. You know, it's, it's funny. I talk about this in the beginning of the book. This is, they're called internal boundaries. And it's, the question is, do you keep your word to yourself? Do you do the things yeah. that you say? you're going to do? Do you show up for yourself? Do you show up for other people? It's, those are internal boundaries. So a lot of times my clients, they would show up and say, I'm drinking too much. So I'm not going to drink anymore during the week. I'm just going to drink on the weekends. And then like two days into that, they would then fall down on that and drink and then come in and feel ashamed and whatever. Mm -hmm. And so finally, I remember saying to one of my clients, I was like, listen, let's, let's forget the shame. There's nothing to be ashamed of, right? Like, some, this is happening for a reason. So in the book, I, I share this and I'll, I'll also give this to the audience right now, your your listeners, because I think it's 
incredibly helpful when we are falling down on ourselves, right? When we are not doing the things we say we're going to do. Like my clients would beat themselves up and be like, I'm so weak. What's wrong with me? I'm just, you know, I'm just a glutton or I'm this or I'm that or whatever. I can't control myself. And I'm like, trust me, there's a psychological reason. Like there's nothing wrong with you. It's not weak and strong. Let's reveal the psychological reason. So there's this concept psychologically called secondary gain, where it's exactly what it sounds like. Primary gain is something that's obvious. Secondary gain is something that can be, it's the unobvious benefit we get from staying stuck. So there's these three quick, you can ask this quick question to yourself in any place in your life. It could be a repeated relationship where you're like, why am I with an unavailable person again? It could be anything. And you can ask, what do I get to not face, not feel, or not experience by staying stuck here? So I said to my client, all right, let's just reveal the secondary gain. Answer this question. What do you get to not face, not feel, not experience by drinking three big glasses of wine every night? And she immediately said, I get to not face the state of my marriage. Mm. I was like, okay, well, now we're cooking with oil. Now we're talking about what it's actually about. It's not about you being weak. It's about you avoiding a conversation you feel ill-equipped to have. You love your person, but you don't think you want to be with them anymore. It is a horrible conflict to be in. And then, of course, we started talking about the real thing. She did eventually end up ending her marriage. But, I mean, that was the real problem, you know? So powerful. And it, the thing that I really love, too, is how you highlighted how the shame gets in the way because if we just shame ourselves and beat ourselves up instead of looking at the secondary gain, the shame just continues the cycle, right? So it's, it it's sure that does. self-compassion piece, the self-compassion. And then one way I love to think about this is just that radical curiosity. How can I take off my judgment hat and just get so curious? Yep. Why am I doing this? And then for her to come up with avoiding the marriage. Yeah. The thing about what I love what you said about curiosity is that, you know, Deepak Chopra says, you know, that the the highest, you know, the most evolved you can be is to become the observer of yourself without judgment. Mm. And I added, and with extreme curiosity. Yes. So instead of being like, what the hell is wrong with you, that inner mean committee, we're able to go, huh, well, that is an interesting reaction that I had to Betty at the office. I wonder, is that really about Betty or is that really about me? Right. Does Betty remind me of someone, you know, I get into this whole other thing that I teach people. How can we figure out if we're having a transference, mm -hmm. right? If we are responding mm -hmm. in this present moment experience being fueled by an unresolved injury or energy from the past. Like sometimes someone just reminds you of something and this activates. I stay away from the word trigger. I got to say, I don't love it. It's just so yeah. used and misused. So yeah. I like to say activated. Mm -hmm. Does it activate something? So I had this um, quick illustration of this. I had this boss when I was in grad school and I was going into my therapist like two weekend, two weeks in a row saying like what a jerk he was and how cold and judgmental and rejecting and a jerk and like just all these things. Like I literally barely knew this guy. And by like the third week, she was like, okay, <laughs> Tara, let, let's, you barely know this guy. He runs, he runs the clinic, right? He's, he wrote a book actually same as Dr. Washington. He's perfectly fine. He was none of those things that was all in my mind. Um, and he wrote a book called when willpower is not enough. This was like, 90s when cocaine was a huge thing it was a, it was a drug treatment clinic anyway so i said to her she's like what is really going on and cuz i would literally when he was coming down the hallway i would literally jump into the ladies room mm -hmm. to not pass him in the hallway mm -hmm. 
she was like, eh, okay, so this is an amplified response. Uh, mm-hmm. Something is happening. Mm-hmm. So she, she basically helped me see. She's like, describe him again. I was like, oh, you know, the type Brooks Brothers suit wearing, Wall Street Journal reading, probably drinks a lot of martinis, probably golfs, you know, the type. He's handsome, got dimples, deep voice. She's like, Terry, who did you just describe? And I was like, oh my God, that's so embarrassing. I just described my father, like to a T, who I was very afraid of growing up. Mm. And I couldn't even see that I was having this transference in that moment. So once I became a therapist, I was like, well, that is something that could be really helpful to my clients. So anytime, if you find yourself, either you get really mad really fast in a situation or It feels even to you after the fact, you're like, uh, was that a little much? Like, was that an amplified response? You can ask yourself a couple of questions. I just call this tool, the three cues tool. Who does this person remind me of? If I had just asked myself that in that moment, I would have totally been like, oh my God, my father, for sure. Where have I felt like this before? Mm. And the third thing is how is this behavioral dynamic familiar to me. So for me, the behavioral dynamic was I was avoiding my boss. And my therapist said to me, listen, you understand why it matters, right? You want to get a job at this place when you graduate. If you don't reveal this transference, your boss will never see how smart you are. You'll never allow yourself to be your authentic self in front of this person. And here's the deal. He's not your father and you're not 10. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's so true and so helpful. So for me, in that moment of recognizing I was having a transference, Mm -hmm. I was able to literally stop it. It went away. I'm not kidding. Mm -hmm. And I did actually get a job at that place when I graduated because after that, I was fine with this guy. I'm sure he thought I was nuts. (laughs) I went from being really cold and like mean (laughs) to being like, hey, what's up? Um, But anyway, that that is something that hopefully you you, um, lovely is listening can take to see where in your own life Mm -hmm. might you be having a transference reaction to someone because we don't want our 10 year old or our seven year old or our 15 year old making important decisions for us, you know, such a powerful story. And I know so many people can relate to it and obviously goes without saying this so applies in your romantic relationships and what is the transference that's coming up with your partner? What is, what is the role they're playing? And, you know, I, I teach in the course that I have, I teach about repetition compulsion. Oh my God. (laughs) I love it. Yeah. This whole concept, I nerd out on this stuff and it is, this is (laughs) life-changing when, when you realize that this is happening, just as you described the awareness of it, just that in and of itself can change the relationship instantly. It's, it's really weird. I say, I, I totally agree. Morgan, it's like this. Sometimes transformation happens like that. Yep. And sometimes transformation takes a lifetime. It's true. You know, mm-hmm. but, but the suffering that, mm-hmm. that we can um, lessen for ourselves, right? And that is an internal boundary. So back to sort of your original thread on this, that being able to, we're observing ourselves with curiosity, without judgment, and going, huh, was that an amplified response from me? Was what they did that bad? Or was it that it reminded me of something that was really bad? Mm. And that's what's happening. And then responding to ourselves with so much compassion. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I'm so aligned with that and the idea that we get to decide, okay, so knowing how 10-year-old me would show up, how does the securely attached emotionally aware, insightful adult version of me, self-compassionate version of me, how does she show up right now and having the power to make that decision and realign with that version of you in the moment? What I thought, you know, that's exactly right. There's so much in the book that where I talk about all of this is a choice, right? If we don't become aware that there's always a parallel process going on, because there is. When you're in conflict, when something is creating pain for you, 
I promise you, <laughs> there is something else going on within you. There is something that needs your attention. There's something that needs to be honored. And when we're talking about boundaries, we all have the what I describe as your downloaded boundary blueprint. Right. So it's this paradigm, you know, in your unconscious mind of all the things. It's your family of origin. It's your country, your culture, your role in the family, how dysfunctional or functional your family was, how closed or open. Was there abuse? Was there addiction? All of those things literally come together. Mm -hmm and create your your blueprint. So most of us don't even know that, you know, in the book, I'm basically walking down the steps into the basement of your mind with you, yeah. right? Holding your hand. I've got a little, one of those little miner's lamps on my head. Don't yeah. worry. I see where we're going. We're going to get some of those boxes and open them up because there's information that we need in order to make the conscious choices that you're talking about. Yes. Right. We need to reveal so we can yeah. stop making ourselves wrong. Yeah. Stop thinking it's about weakness because it's not. Right. And go, huh, I am radically curious, as you said. Yeah. About why I relate to boundaries the way I do. So quickly, my my two sons on what does it even mean to have good boundaries? It is so basic. It's you knowing your preferences, your desires, your limits, and your deal breakers. And having the ability to communicate to them when you so choose. That's it, according to me. Beautiful. Love it. Right? I and love so much, and it makes so much sense. Right? Because people, there's this overwhelm, I find. And I've done, obviously, in the last <laughs> two months, I've done a lot of interviews about this. Yes. But there's a lot of, um, there's a sense of overwhelm of like, where do I even start? Right. Like I'm a boundary disaster. And I, so I created a, a quick boundary quiz. It's 13 uh, questions. It's free. It's just, just go to boundaryquiz.com if you want to take it. And it gives you your archetype. Mm -hmm. Like you could be a pushover or a peacekeeper or an ice queen. You could be a loner. And by answering these questions, you get an idea of how are you right now relating to boundaries, especially when you're stressed or out of balance? So I sort of put you in scenarios mm -hmm. so that you're like, how would I actually respond to that? Mm -hmm. If I don't drink and I'm with 10 people and the bar bill is seven grand and they want me to split it with them or whatever, right? So, right. so being put in a situation that would sort of mm -hmm. kick up your need to talk true, to assert yourself, you know, so that, that can be helpful to see what why you relate the way you do. What was the, where, where can they get that quiz? Yeah. Just boundaryquiz.com. Boundaryquiz.com. I love it. That's awesome. Um, I want to ask you, cause I was reading some excerpts from your book and I'm going to read the entire book. Cause it is so good. Y'all you need to get it. It is really good. Oh, I love the way you write, honestly. Um, it's like a talk though, right? It's, it's very, it is, which is pretty, I, which yeah. is very similar to me. I'm like, we are so on the same wavelength. I love it. <laughs> Seriously. Love it. You want to uh, do a conference? Like, come on, like, let, let's do something. Um, right. But you, in one of the excerpts was this idea about how women we've been socialized into, and you have this phrase that I love self abandoning codependence. <laughs> It gives me goosebumps to read it. Like, can you talk to me about that? I sure can. So in the book, I'm talking about how we've been raised and praised to be self-abandoning codependents yeah. and how what that inherently means is that you have terrible boundaries, that we get um, praised, we get love, we get acceptance for abandoning ourselves, for saying yes when we want to say no, for being a good girl, for smiling, right? Where's my happy girl? Turn that frown around. You're like, why? I'm crying. Why am I turning the frown around? But there is a yeah. lot of conditioning where we've learned that to be self-sacrificing is virtuous, mm -hmm. that we should do that for everyone. You know, someone will talk about their friend like, oh, she's amazing. She'd give the shirt off her back to anyone. You're like, Betty, keep your friggin' shirt on. Like, how about some discernment? Why are we giving our shirt to anyone? Yeah. Like, but again, that's what we think. So how codependency comes into the mix with boundaries is that with in my therapy practice, first of all, I'm a recovering codependent, like really, really, really bad. 
I was a very extreme codependent because of my place in my family. I was the hero child. I was the youngest, but the designated oldest. It's like a whole thing that that brings in so much more codependency than I would have if that hadn't been true. Okay. So with codependency, what I was seeing now, what is codependency? I say it's basically being overly invested in the feeling states, the decisions, the outcomes and the circumstances of the people that you care about to the detriment of your internal peace, financial well-being, physical well-being. That's what codependency is, right? Oh Overgiving, gosh. overfunctioning, right? I'm also a recovering codependent. And I just had a flashback of this one time an undergraduate living on student loans, no, no money. And I had a boyfriend who was an international student and I bought him his $2,400 plane ticket home Stop. with my student loan money. And I oh ate God. beans and rice. Anyways, wow. that's an example. Yep. <laughs> that's a perfect example because it was to the detriment of the your detriment stomach. Of myself. <laughs> right. Yeah. So anyways, yep. I loved your definition. I think a lot of people will resonate with that. So thank you. Yes. Moving into though, the my clients didn't resonate with the old school definition of codependency, right? Because what do we think of? Mm -hmm. Melody Beatty codependent no more, right. you have to be involved with an addict, right. you have to be an enabler. Yeah. So if I would mention it to my highly capable female yeah. clients, they would be like, no, dude, you don't get it. Right. Everyone's dependent on me. Hello. I'm the one who makes all the dough. I'm doing everything. Everyone comes to me. I fix everyone. I help everyone. Yeah. I'm like, right. You're describing codependency. So I changed the name specific to the population that is my population and myself, which is high functioning codependency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then my clients were like, oh yeah, that's totally me. I'm like, right. <laughs> Are you doing things for people that they should yes. and can be doing for themselves? Yes. Are you over giving, over committing, right? Yes. Over functioning, saying yes, when you should be saying no, yes. but you're so friggin' capable. You know, it's like, if you look at, um, you know, I always say about Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, there's there's this statement that Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did, except she did it dancing backwards and in heels. Mm. That's like high functioning codependency. And if you guys are so young, you don't know who those people are. Wait, that's too young. But I hope you do. <laughs> <laughs> Google. Google Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, <laughs> please. <laughs> yeah, this is so my clientele as well. These, I, you know, doctors, lawyers, nurses, these yeah. high achieving, you know, women who have done amazing in their careers and their lives, and they keep dating non reciprocal partners. Yeah. Well, let's also another really important point about codependency, high functioning or otherwise. Yeah. It is a covert and or overt bid for control. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let that land listeners, because that's really what it is. We don't want the friend to make that mistake. We don't want the boyfriend to not go home for Christmas. We, we can't, we can't allow others to have their own experiences because it makes us so anxious for them to be in pain, for us to see the disaster coming, we ha we feel compelled to stop them. So I always say to my clients and in my courses that I teach, yeah, I want you to check your urgency. Mm. This check. is so yeah. powerful. I hope the listeners are getting this. Let's just let's make sure. Yeah. So this idea that. It's, it almost goes back to secondary gain or kind of this idea of the unseen benefit of being codependent is that you get a sense of control yep. and because for your partner to be unhappy, is it fair to say that there's fear that if they're unhappy, they will leave me or the relationship will end? You know, I mean, listen, sure, people with, with could you know, abandonment, abandonment stuff, of mm -hmm. course. But here's the thing. Most high-functioning codependents, we don't even get that far down the road. 
because we feel the urgency right now. We are constantly give auto advice giving. Yeah. And not just listen, I was the worst. I didn't just, I wasn't just fixing my boyfriends. Trust me. I was fixing my hair colorist, my mail carrier. I'd be like, Phil, this is what you need to do about your female problems. (laughs) Like stop anybody. Nobody was safe. Because I always had a good idea of how I would listen. I have ideas. Yeah. I, I have a book for you, Phil. Wait, hold on, mailman. I'm going to go inside and get the book that I have for you. Like, yeah. Oh my God, stop it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. And it's it's this. I feel pain when you're when you feel pain. Yeah. You know, I'm, the, I'm taking on your experience. I'm not letting you have your experience. I'm taking yes. It on. But here's the thing. So don't feel too bad about it if this is you, because when you grow up being raised and praised for being the self-abandoning codependent, this, I thought this was my job. So one of my sisters was in a bad situation. She was more of like the, she she was like acting out the veiled feelings of the group, if I can say that, because it's true. Mm. You know, like you'll have a black sheep, quote unquote, in the family right. or someone who's acting stuff out. Trust me, they're chosen by the family system to- yes right? To get the, that oh, energy yeah. out. But anyway, she was in a bad situation and I was talking to my therapist and crying because it was not good living in the woods with an abusive person who was doing crack. They had no running oh. water. Like it was bad. Yeah. And there was no, that's, that's literally no, and I'm not exaggerating at all. Yeah. That was the exact situation. Right. And I was saying to my therapist, I was crying. I was like, I, I've sent her money. I just don't get it. Like how, to, how is she letting this person do this? It's so painful, but it was like, it was happening to me. It was so mm. distressing. And she just said to me, Terry, let me ask you something. What makes you think that you know what Jenna needs to learn in this life? Mm. And I was like, uh, well, I think we can agree. She doesn't need to learn it by living with a crackhead in the middle of the woods with no running water. And she was like, I can't agree to that. I'm not God. I have no idea what your sister needs to learn. But do you know what's actually happening for you? And I was like, obviously not. So please tell me. And she said, your sisters, you know, you've worked for 20 years because I started therapy when I was 19. She's like, you work for many years to create an internal peace and a pretty harmonious life. Your sister's dumpster fire of a life is really messing with that peace that you've created. Mm. You really want your pain about her situation Mm -hmm. to stop. Mm -hmm. So you want to fix it, but it's not your situation. You can only fail doing that. Mm -hmm. So maybe you need to draw better boundaries. Maybe you need to step back until she wants to get help or whatever. So that was so eye opening because A, I didn't think I had a choice. I thought if I loved my sister and I was a good sister, I would do anything to help her get out of that situation. But that wasn't accurate. And it, there was, it was a relief to be like, wait, so I'm not even on the hook to do that. And of course, a sadness. And then I had to really deal with how I felt with her being in this dangerous situation. Mm-hmm. But I was able to say to her that I was able to tell my sister, listen, I can't listen to you talking about this person yeah. and how terrible they are to you. I love you. If you yeah. ever are serious about wanting to get the hell out, I'm definitely your girl for sure. Yeah. And right. I stepped back and we didn't talk very much. And then nine months later, she's like, SOS, I'm ready. And I was like, okay. My husband and I helped her, moved her out, let her stay in this little teeny like cottage that we had. Like she got her degree. She stopped drinking. She st- she's fine. That was many, that was a really long time ago. Hence why I'm allowed to even tell the story. Um, and yeah. She's been sober ever since, but that I know that there are so many people listening, you yep. know, Morgan that feel yep. that they'd be a bad sister, a bad friend, a bad daughter if they don't do these things. So a big part of becoming a boundary boss is learning what is your side of the street and what is someone else's side of the street, you know? Beautiful story. There's two pieces from that that I want to pull out that I think people need to really learn. Um, One is this whole piece about that was what was best for her, right? If you were stepping in and, and taking on her experience, we think that's helping the person, but oftentimes it's enabling or it's more hurtful to the person. 
So acknowledging that sometimes the thing that we think is helpful is actually hurtful. Um, and then this Agreed. piece of how when we're really good at fixing people and we're really good at overfunctioning, it's easy to be in that mode and do that for people instead of facing our own pain. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's a virtuous distraction. Ooh, a virtuous. I love that. A vir- yes. Right. Like we tell ourselves. Yeah. It's a virtuous distraction. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, it is avoidance mm. of our own lives. And you yes. end up being angry. When we overfunction like this, we do end up being martyred, Ooh. bitter, Blaming people, resentful. And even if people are, you know, Morgan, so true. Even if people are grateful, when we give from that kind of a disordered place, they can actually never be grateful enough. That's so true. Right? Mm -hmm. Because we shouldn't be giving from fear. We shouldn't be giving from, I want to be praised. Mm -hmm. I want to make myself indispensable so that person can't leave me. Yes. If I do all of these things, then it guarantees my safety in the relationship, but it actually doesn't, of course, obviously. Mm-hmm. And these are all boundary issues. They are mm-hmm. emotional, mental, some of them physical, but when you really get clear yeah. about your your side of the street, what is your responsibility, which is basically what I'm walking you through in this book, you really know like you're so much less guilty yeah right because we feel like we should we should we should Mm -hmm. when you really understand what is driving your behavior you're like who was i because here's the thing you i want to i want to say something about something you said just a moment ago you said we think it's the right thing we think it will help but maybe it won't but more important than that that's true what you said is totally true but even more important than that, it is not our right mm-hmm. to think we know. Right. And it isn't our job, even if we've been through it, even if we do know. Yeah. It's like we're taking away yeah. the other person's. You know, um, one of my friends, he, he's, uh, he passed away, but one of my friends, he, his name is Russell. And he was one of the founders of the Grief Recovery Institute. Russell Friedman was his name. Oh, okay. And he said, giving people unadva- um, unasked for advice or criticism robs them of their dignity. Mm, mm. So true. Oh my God. So true. So true. Yeah. We have to give people the opportunity to allow us to, you know, help or yeah, give, give them the opportunity to express what it is that they need instead of us assuming doing the work. Yeah. Yeah. And even if they ask, you know, Morgan, even if, because, you know, once you've been a bossy fixer, like people want to come to you for everything all the time still. My first question to anyone, because I was a bossy fixer for a really long time is, all right, well, tell me, babe, what do you think you should do? Right. What's your gut feeling? Yes. Because think about it. When when I was when I was like couldn't wait to jump in with Phil, my postman, and everyone yeah. else, I was literally centering myself. Yes. Literally diving into the middle of their circumstance. Yeah. When being a good friend or a good therapist or a good anyone is being like, you're the expert on you, Phil. What do you think? What do you think? Let's unpack what you think. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and it's not to say we never weigh in with our close friends. Of course you will. Yeah. But I just want the the auto advice giving yeah. to understand that if you are auto advice giving or allowing others to do it to you, that is a disordered mental boundary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So good. This is so valuable. Um, I I think that really when we get good at boundaries and we master this art of I'm giving from the place of, I want to give, right. I want to connect. I want joy. Then you get, you get to experience the joy of that. Right. And when, when you're, 
(laughs) when you're not giving out of this other place, the disordered boundary Mm -hmm. place, you're giving out of a healthy place. Um, you just have, you don't have room for your old ways of being, right? Because it's, yes, you're it's filling so up true. your life with joy and with positive and with, hey, so I want to talk about that a little bit if, sure. if we have some time and just, because I think, I don't know about you, but it seems like there's been almost like cancel culture of like, sometimes boundaries get this bad name of it means cut just just go live in the woods cut everybody out of your life and just be be an island right and yeah but no when we have good boundaries it supports amazing connections right it does they are the truth is that boundaries are the bridges and i will venture to say the only bridges to deep vibrant intimacy yes absolutely they are the the healthiest Love is yeah. boundaried love. The healthiest people, the, the most, as Brene Brown would say, the most wholehearted people yes. are boundaried people. But yeah. let's look, and let's look at it this way from what you're talking about. Yeah. If we say yes when we want to say no, if we mm-hmm. don't, don't tell someone, if we're like passive aggressive when we're unhappy, like we slam a door or roll our eye or wait a long time to text someone back to let them know about our displeasure instead of actually using words, all of these things, we are giving people corrupted info about who we are. Mm. Mm-hmm. So if you're going along to get along, if you if your badge of honor is like, you know me, I'm easy breezy, like why is it good? Why is you having a preference a friggin' burden to anyone? Mm. Your preferences, your desires, your limits, and your deal breakers are the things that make you uniquely, beautifully, amazingly you. Yes. And so think about it this way. When you learn the language of healthy boundaries, which I'll teach you, you're literally allowing the people in your life to know who you are. And I can't tell you how many women have come into my practice in their fifth or sixth decade of life. Yeah. And they're like, I've checked all the boxes. I got all the things, I got money. I'm super successful. My kids are all on track. They've all gone to Ivy League, like all the things. Yes. Uh, is this all there is? Yeah. And I'm like, no, because you spent a life checking boxes that someone else designed. And saying yes when you wanted to friggin' say no. So the big tragedy and not ever mastering the art of boundaries is that how, if you don't ever really let people know who you are, how can they ever authentically love you if they don't authentically know you? So beautiful. So powerful. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. I mean, like, it's tragic to me. It is. Yeah. It's painful. It is. Yeah. And avoidable is the whole point, which is why I wrote a book on it. (laughs) Yeah. And it makes me think about, you know, obviously um, we become experts in the areas that we need to learn. And in my past dating life, I was a chameleon. I used to say I could get anybody to love me, but it was because Mm -hmm. I would just change who I was depending on who the partner was. Right. So it's this whole idea of wow, relationships got a lot easier for me when I learned how to set boundaries, how to show up as myself, who I really am authentically, um, because then there's no facade, there's no eggshells, there's no dancing around. Um, And then the beauty of receiving love that is given to you as your authentic self, and you're just existing and it's effortless. I mean, that, that kind of love feels so good and it feels safe because it is safe. Right. Because you also have yourself part of what we're talking about is Mm -hmm. this builds a certain amount of self-esteem Exactly. where you realize what you think, how you feel, who you are, what you want matters. And you are setting the bar. So your relationship with yourself sets the bar for every other relationship in your life. If you hold yourself in low regard, talk Mm -hmm. badly about yourself, talk badly about your body, whatever it is, you will inevitably find people who agree with your low self-esteem, your low self-assessment. If you overgive, 
you will, without a doubt, find people who will overtake happily, yes. right? So let's yeah. not, you yeah. know, let's really think about yeah. losing the fear because it's just, listen, it's fear of rejection. But I, the last thing I want to say, here's the thing. You guys are not that fragile. Like you're actually not. So it's okay. Sometimes if people don't like what you said, they wanted you to do this thing, but you changed your mind. You gave yourself permission to change your mind. Yeah. Relationships are not that fragile. And if they are, that's telling you something. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Yes. I loved when I got to the place a couple years ago in doing the work where rejection actually kind of felt good in a way. Cause I go, great. They're not meant to be in my life. I'm glad it's rejection. I'm getting the data and it's making space for who is meant to be in my life. So yeah, that's a sign when you're, when you're like, Hey, good. It's okay. Please reject me, right? If it's not yes. a fit, it's not a fit. And that's and do it thing. now. <laughs> and do it now. Do it sooner rather than later. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about, please. Yeah. Um, all right, hold on. I wanted to make sure I told you I have a gift for you listeners. Oh my gosh. I could talk to you forever. Like, how did this time go so fast? I don't know. We, I could talk about, yeah. <laughs> it's just We're just so interested in the same stuff though. I you know, know, it's like I love just it. mental health. I love All right. It so so my gift for you guys is go to uh, boundaryboss.me forward slash vulnerable for our podcast. Yeah. And it's going to be boundaries and codependency. So um, um, it's more about what we were talking about so that you can actually do an assessment of where are you right now on the codependency spectrum. And what's up with your relationships? That's basically what is in there. I think you're going to love it. It's a little video and a downloadable PDF. Thank you so much. And we will put the link to that in the show notes as well. And Terry, one more time, where can people get your book? And yeah, tell us all the ways to get your book, connect with you. All right. Um, you can get the book at boundarybossbook.com. And you can buy it anywhere, right? It's it's for sold. It's everywhere. being sold everywhere. Yeah. But at boundarybossbook.com, I have a lot of really, I love a bonus moment. So I have a lot of really beautiful bonuses that you might like. So you want to go there. Um, you can take the boundary quiz at boundaryquiz.com. You're going to get your gift at boundaryboss.me forward slash vulnerable. And um, Really, where I hang out most is probably Insta, I would say, just at Terry Cole. And my website is terrycole.com and my podcast, The Terry Cole Show. Oh my God, all the things. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for all the value you brought to the listeners. I appreciate you. I know they will appreciate this episode. You're doing incredible work. Oh. I hope you just keep keep doing what you're doing. It's amazing. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really had a great time. Yes. All right, listeners. And as always, I'm wishing you high self-worth and great relationships. We'll talk with you soon. You guys, thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate each and every one of you. The best way that you can thank me is by sharing this episode on Instagram Facebook and making sure that you tag me at Dr. Morgan Coaching. And it would really mean the world to me if you took just two minutes to leave me a five star review on iTunes. This podcast is not free to produce. And the more that you help this little show grow, the more people will have access to this valuable information. So until next time, I'm wishing you high self worth and great relationships. Thank you for being part of this community.